good morning. Um, but first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues, as mentioned by Dr. Shar a while ago. Um, these are Dr. Justin Picat, Dr. Sunny Domingue, and Dr. Val Ulep, who make up the, the technical committee for this year. So each year, PIDS assigns a technical committee to facilitate the formulation of the DPRM and APPC themes, or Annual Public Policy Conference themes. This year, the technical committee came up with a concept paper or background study that serve as the basis for crafting the DPRM theme, which is bouncing back together, innovating governance for the new normal. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you the rational and the DPRM theme, as well as the annual public policy conference theme. As you may know, and has been mentioned a while ago, the annual public policy conference, conference or APPC is a DPRM's culminating activity. And the conference where various topics under the DPRM theme will be discussed in greater detail. So after my presentation, Dr. Justine Sika will carry on with a brief discussion of the insights that we have obtained from that background study. And it provides a review of the literature as well as an examination of some local and international experiences that are, that are relevant to our theme. So the theme for this year's APPC or Annual Public Policy Conference is innovating governance, building resilience against COVID-19 pandemic and other risks. Next slide, please. The unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic is by far the most challenging public health crisis the world has faced in a century. It has overwhelmed global and national health service and disaster management infrastructure and brought economies to a standstill. It becomes a much larger social support or social protection issue with direct implications on the government's capacity to finance, administer, and design effective strategies. It has put local governments at the forefront of quarantine enforcement, contact tracing and, in, and monitoring, as well as in program implementation, such as in administering the social amelioration. We may all agree that th these challenging times had exposed a lot of governance and structural issues that we must address. This is the reason why we centered this year's DPRM and APPC themes on the need for innovation in governance, especially in the public sector, given its crucial function in or facilitating an enabling environment. Next slide, please. What are these structural and governance issues? It is not our intention to present all of the issues that we have in governance, but only the key ones manifested in the past few months during the pandemic, and these are the following. First, there is lack of and sometimes failure of coordination between and among government units. Another key issue is the lack of protocols or manuals of operations to deal with such an event at the onset. Also, the poor and updated state of our information system cause delays in data gathering efforts that are essential for understanding the real-time situation upon which key decisions are made. We also observed the absence of a verified tool or the need to improve the existing tool for targeting program beneficiaries of social assistance efforts, which hampered the implementation of programs like the SAP. We also noted the lack of technically capable workforce at various levels of the government, and this was visible in the pandemic period. Next, please. With these issues and many other issues that we did not mention, we believe that the pandemic is an impetus, a rare window of opportunity we can all learn from and innovate. These are, or there are articles showing that it has ignited the geniuses in many. It has brought people together to collaborate and innovate. And this is because the effects are so wide ranging. We noted that some countries took advantage of situations such as this, even less um, challenging, and they reformed. In the Philippines, though we've seen some improvements, we want to, 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 to say that we must take advantage of this rare win opportunity in a substantial way now that we have the huge support from the government and where people are more likely to back government decisions for innovation. So based on our brief uh, review of governance issues, we chose three key themes that we must focus on. These are institutions, people, and smart systems. So why institutions? A lot of the issues that we face concern protocols, uh, strategies, mechanisms, standards, whether these are for coordinating, coordinating government units and state 
toward a common vision or goal, or whether this is about sharing information that are vital in decision-making processes. Apart from institutions, we need to upgrade, upskill our people, the civil service more specifically. People are vital to innovation, hence we must examine this aspect. Lastly, we want PC and the DPRM to tap smart systems, which are vital for achieving seamless and efficient delivery. As mentioned earlier, we have weak information systems and infrastructure, and it is essential that we innovate in our systems. We propose to have these key themes in the discussions because of their interdependence with one another, to develop and take advantage of smart systems in policy making and service delivery. The proper legal framework must exist, stipulating the protocols and standards, and people must possess the analytical, operational, and even political capacity in the development and implementation of smart systems and other systems. So what is um, what is governance innovation? Let me now move to the definition of an important concept here. In the public sector, innovation refers to the implementation of a significant change in the way organization operates or in the products it provides. They comprise new and significant changes to services and goods, operational processes, organizational methods, and the way organizations communicate with users or with the citizenry. These must be new to the organization, although they, have, they may have been developed by others. They can either be the result of decisions within organizations or in response to new regulations or policy measures. What activities can be considered innovation? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, these are in-house or acquired external activities that intend to or actually lead to the implementation of innovation. They can be R&D activities or they can be education and training of staff related to innovation. They can be experimentation for innovation and others. Next, please. Next slide. Yes, thank you. The innovation activities can be categorized into various types, um, which are quite useful to know. These are process innovation, product innovation, organizational innovation, and communication innovation. Due to time constraints, I will be providing detailed definition, but simply, this innovation refers to the new and improved methods, while product innovation refers to new or improved services. One-stop shops are an example of organizational innovation, while automatic SMS updates, such as in the, in the case of calamities, is an example of communication innovation. In our review of various innovation activities inside and outside the country, we found that it is good to take stock of what's currently being implemented. This helps us realize that innovation is not impossible and, in fact, can be done continuously for achieving significant improved outcomes, even for a developing country such as ours. Dr. Justin Sikat will discuss some of these governance innovations that we have reviewed from the literature which you can all learn from or which you can use as discussion points in the upcoming conference and other events under the DPRM. Dr. Sikat, please. Thank you, Dr. Tabuga. Uh, next slide, please, Wang. So good morning. I'll be presenting to you the Development Policy Research Month's uh, sub-themes for the culminating annual public policy conference which uh, for this year's theme focuses on innovating governance to bounce back together. Um, as Dr. Tabuga mentioned earlier, we had identified the key issues um, this past year in terms of government's response and providing goods and services with this pandemic. And the key issues focused largely around the lack of information or the lack of coordination or sharing this information, um, the gra grappling with the uh, correct protocols and manners in which to deliver. So from these, we identified three key areas, as mentioned earlier, and looked to similar experiences in different countries. So the sub-themes for this year's annual public policy conference are institutional innovations, innovations in the civil service, and smart systems. Next slide, please. So for institutional innovations, we would like to highlight information or information technology as an institution. What exactly are institutions? By Nobel Prize winning economists, Douglas North and Oliver Williamson, they define institutions as the rules of the game. This could be the laws, the mandates, the protocol, the infrastructure, the data technology, which are the foundation for governance, which is the play of the game. 
As we saw in the response to COVID, information played a crucial role first in directly identifying those who were affected by COVID, those who were ill, getting them healthcare, contact tracing, those who might be ill, uh, reporting, monitoring, and sharing this information. So that's one major role of information. The second is to identify those who were indirectly affected by the COVID pandemic because of economic slowdowns due to the quarantines that were necessary to stop the spread of the virus. So an example of this perfectly would be the SAP, as mentioned by Dr. Tabuga earlier. This was the program that um, aimed to um, reach 18 million households, uh, the poorest of the poor, and um, the delay in the first tranche distribution, according to the Department of Social Welfare and Development, and, uh, Development was because primarily of the lack of integrated information systems to identify who, in fact, the household um, beneficiaries were, um, the challenge or the varied uh, manners of implementation of social welfare programs in local governments, as well as the challenge in vetting um, the, uh, to avoid duplication of distribution of the SAP. So had an integrated information system been in place, had it been linked, let's say, to Listahanan, which is the social welfare uh, targeting system of the Philippines, and had it been directly connected to the bank accounts of the beneficiaries, it would have been easier to distribute um, the much needed benefits to those at the timeliest possible time. So we look to other countries and their experiences, uh, similar experiences such as the Philippines. And we found two general theme, um, areas of focus for reform. First would be in terms of data transparency and sharing. In the case of South Korea, after they experienced MERS in 2015, and the case of Taiwan, after they experienced SARS in 2003, they overcame issues in data privacy, implementing various reforms in data sharing and transparency, as well as um, information campaigns to build trust in these reforms. Another area that um, we saw in the literature was that there is um, strengthening and establishing of both short-term and long-term responses to public health issues by establishing institutions across different public institutions, uh, agile responses once public health threats were recognized, and as well as systematic and procedural threat responses. For the um, establishing of institutions across different public institutions, what the Korean government did was they established a Korean Center for Develop Disease Control um, in the case of Taiwan as well, they established a mechanism where there would be a central epidemic command center once a threat was perceived. Uh, Singapore's National Center for Infectious Diseases also served the same purpose. Um, in terms of agile responses, uh, we know that Taiwan and Vietnam immediately closed their borders uh, when, it, when they perceived the threat earlier this year of the COVID pandemic. Um, at the same time, in the case of Taiwan, they link the immigration records with the health insurance records so that if a person went to a doctor, it would immediately reflect there if that person had traveled, in fact, to a COVID, um, a country that has COVID. Um, next slide, please. With re regards to innovations and governance innovations in the civil service, we reviewed the literature and um, grouped together according to the certain aspect or element of the civil service that these reforms try to address. So in the first column on the left, you can see that there are four major aspects or elements of the civil service and some prerequisites necessary. So let's go through them individually. First, career incentives was a major um, topic um, when it came to reforms in the civil service. It was intended, it's intended to attract stronger candidates such as in the Zambian experience, as well as the European bottom-up approach. Uh, communication and information, as I mentioned earlier, also plays a huge role. Singapore's public service in the 21st century reform introduced a feedback loop so that management and staff could have continuous improvements in their communication. The Zambian experiment um, aimed to reduce information asymmetry and provide as complete information as possible. Um, Another very important element in these reforms in governance innovations in the civil service was the perception that management and staff all equally are involved in innovations in the civil service. So it's, it's a partnership. In the case of Singapore, coordinated vision 
more than coordinated action is underscored. What does this mean? It means that it's important to have coordinated action to implement governance innovations, but all those in civil service should also have a coordinated vision. Um, investment in management and staff also is um, high on the list for these reforms, uh, like in the case of Singapore and the European bottom-up approach. Now, where do innovations come from? Well, there are two, internal and external. So internally, the Nordic approach uh, identifies specific roles for management, top management, managers, and staff. Whereas the bottom-up approach supports innovation and governance innovation through experiments within the organization. Uh, in terms of external sources of innovation, the knowledge scanning approach used by European countries seeks training and collaboration with external bodies. For example, uh, government could learn from business processes um, to improve the delivery of public goods and services, as well as look outside of the country for innovations. Um, however, all of these innovations have a huge prerequisite. Okay? What are the prerequisites? There has to be political will, according to the Singaporean reform. Uh, at the same time, there must be continuous learning or growth mindset of all those involved. And, and there should be the diverse team construction, meaning that there are those who are creatives and come up with the innovations. But there are also those who are good at um, implementing or putting into action the ideas or the innovations that are created. Next, please. As for the, the, the final sub theme of our conference this year, it's smart systems. We saw in the literature that in response to risks and epidemics experienced by other countries, or even some cities here in the Philippines, they had established centralized command centers, either for disasters, infectious diseases, public safety and security. However, again, the prerequisite of this was that there had to be integrated information technology systems and data interoperability across all these levels for these command centers to be successful. Next slide, please. So I'll be showing you some examples in the case of Estonia, which has been 30 years in the making. Um, the major steps taken to establish e-government based on Estonian information policy included establishing smart data infrastructure for its interconnected system, and secondly, implementing mandatory digital identification. These reforms allowed them to now provide services such as e-voting, e-taxes, e-healthcare, e-notary, e-school, e-police, and so on and so forth. The list is very long. Um, for Service Canada, it offers a single point of access to federal government services to 50 programs and services of 16 departments and agencies. And the benefits of this was that it allowed in terms of government operations, cost reduction with enhanced efficiency because of the implementation of controls to avoid fraud and abuses in certain services. It also provided the necessary data for rigorous forecasting, planning, tracking, and monitoring of government programs. In the case of Singapore Smart Nation, it was both public and private reforms that were instituted. First, similar to Estonia, was the national digital identity. Second, were e-payments. Third, Smart Nation sensor platform. Fourth, Smart Urban Mobility. Fifth, Moments of Life. And sixth, Codex. In the Philippines also, there are a couple of cities that I'd like to mention here that had central command stations for different purposes. In the case of Davao City, there were IT apps uh, constructed to reduce crime and respond to international threats. And these apps use data from CCTV surveillance and the geographical information systems, uh, central 911 command information, and data from the Interpol, which, was accessed, which is accessed through the Philippine Center on Transnational Crimes. In the case of Makati City also, there are smart systems for disaster preparedness and communication. Next slide, please. How do we innovate and build resilience? Well, for institutions, we need to create an environment conducive to innovations by installing and implementing or simply fully implementing existing laws and mandates because there are several that need to be fully implemented that will enable interagency collaboration and has integrated interconnected information systems for data interoperability and clear protocols for operations. In terms of people, we need to provide an effective incentive structure in the civil service 
to retain good people in government and give clear information about career incentives and movement with a growth learning mindset, which is also very crucial. There needs to be continuous um, upskilling, retooling of the workforce to it to become adaptive to changes in this volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. In terms of smart systems, we need to have updated and integrated information systems, promote data and information digitalization, and ensure that there is secure data sharing transmission, information access, electronic data archiving, as well as improve IT infrastructure. But more importantly, we have to build trust through information campaigns so that everyone has their role and plays their role in bouncing back together. Thank you.